I married a man who, on a scale from 1 to 10, is a 12. But he tells me that as a young man, he was not a great student. In fact, to this day, he has a reoccurring nightmare that he's on his way to take an exam, and he has not prepared. But he learned from that. And when he started to work, he prepared for our future. He saved and saved, which was very important four years ago when he lost his job. He was prepared. Preparation is very important, whether it's for life or for death. We're about to study the book of First Chronicles. It's a book about temple preparation. Now, we are starting a new series of studies. The first set of books were the Pentateuch, five books that dealt with the nation of Israel. They became a nation. The next set of books we called the kingdom books because even though in the book of Judges there was no king in Israel, remember everybody did what was right in their own eyes, but we came to 1 Samuel and the people demanded a king. So God gave them a king. The kingdom was established in 1 Samuel. It was united in 2 Samuel under King David. It was divided in 1 Kings, and it was exiled in 2 Kings. There were 330 years of judges and 460 years of kings. Now, the people have been exiled. Now, remember, there were two, two tribes. The northern tribes were, of Israel were exiled into Assyria. The southern tribes of Judah were exiled into Babylon. They have been exiled for 70 years in Babylon. And in the meantime, Persia has conquered Babylon, and King Cyrus makes a decree that the Jews can return to their land. They can return to, to Canaan. Now, this book is written to those Jews, and as you see on the timeline, it is written after the 70 years. However, it is repeating information we've already read in First and Second Samuel. Those books were about the kingdom. Remember, David and the kingdom. God repeats that same information, but with a different point of view. Where that was political, this is spiritual. Where that, those books were about the kingdom, First Chronicles is about the temple. This is a book of temple preparation. The word chronicle actually means account or record of events. This book also has another name in the English. It means things omitted. And this book actually omits a few things from the book of 1 Samuel. For example, it omits the fact that David sinned with Bathsheba, that he sent her husband out to, to be murdered, it omits those bad kings we had in Judah. It does include 20 chapters of new information about all these details on building the temple. This book is being written to those people who have been exiled for 70 years as a book of encouragement. Now, we can easily divide it into two sections, and if you would open up with me to First Chronicles, chapter 1, we have the first section of nine chapters of genealogies. Now, I told you when we studied Genesis, if you liked soap operas, you would love to study about the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, J Jacob, and Joseph. When we hit 1 Samuel, I said, if you enjoyed biographies, you would love the stories of Saul, Samuel, Saul, and David. When we come to 1 Chronicles, if you enjoy reading the phone book, you're going to love this book. <laughs> it is nine chapters of genealogies. And sometimes when you read these things, you think, I can't even pronounce half their names, and who cares? But come to chapter 1, verse 1, because it starts with Adam. God, the writer starts at the very beginning. This was written by Ezra, which makes a lot of sense because Ezra was a priest. It was either written by him or one of his contemporary priests. And, of course, the priests were important in the temple. This book is all about the temple. He starts with Adam, the first man. Adam had a son, Seth. Seth is not the only son of Adam. We know that. There was... Uh, Cain and Abel, they're not mentioned. So obviously this genealogy is of a particular line of people. We go through Seth's family. We come down to verse 4. We have Noah, Shem. Then we go through Shem's sons. We come down to verse 34. We have Abraham. Now anyone reading this would have first thought, Adam. I remember Adam. He 
listened to the wrong voice. He listened to Satan and God made him a promise. He would destroy Satan. We'd come to Abraham. They would say, I remember Abraham. God made him a promise. He would be a great nation. He would have the land. He would have a, a descendant that would bless the whole world. This verse tells us that Abraham had a son, Isaac, who had twin sons, Esau and Israel. Of course, that was Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. You come to chapter 2. We follow the line of Jacob or Israel, and we are given his 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. And then in verse 3, we follow the line of Judah. See, we see that God is following a very particular family line here. You come over to verse 12 of chapter 2, and we have Boaz. Remember Boaz, the kinsman redeemer? Ruth's husband, the one who was able and willing to redeem her, to purchase her. Boaz had a son Obed, who had a son Jesse, who had a son David. There in two chapters, we've gone from Adam right down to David. And if we continued reading in chapter 3, we would find David had a son Solomon, who had a number of sons on down through. And we have the genealogy of 21 kings from King David right down to the time of the exile. And your first thought might be, why does God waste that much time and effort and paper on all these people's names? I think there are three reasons, at least that I can think of. First of all, he is encouraging the exiles. These people have for 70 years not even been a nation. They've been slaves or servants in a foreign land. They don't have a land. They don't have a king. They don't have a throne and they don't have a temple. It's been destroyed. And to those people, he says, remember the past. Remember who you are. You are descendants of King David. Remember the temple. You've had a relationship with God in the past. He's lived in your midst and you have worshiped him. You are somebody special. The second reason I think that he has included in these genealogies is because it proves who Jesus is. It proves he's the Messiah. We have this book of First Chronicles, which in the Hebrew Bible was the last book included. So a person reading that would read this genealogy and the very next book would be Matthew. Matthew starts off with the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and it goes through these same names. So what is God doing? He's proving that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus has a legitimate right to the throne of David. And the third thing these genealogies do, I think, is encourage us. You and I are not little blips on a screen or little dust particles on this earth. We have a name. And our name is important. And God keeps chronicles or records. He puts our name in a book. He has a book of life. And your name can be in that book if you've asked Jesus into your life to be your Savior. And he says when he puts your name in that book, he keeps records beside it. Look at chapter 4, for example. Chapter 4, verse 9. He not only puts your name in a book, but he keeps records. He's, there's either good stuff or bad stuff written beside your name. We have Jabez, a man more honorable than his brothers. This is a very obscure character. This is all we know about him. But in verse 10, it says that he called on the God of Israel and he prayed a prayer that had four parts. He said, oh, that you would bless me indeed. Number two, that you would enlarge my border that your hand might be with me and that you would keep me from harm. And God granted what he requested. There is a man's name with something very positive written beside it, isn't it? That's quite a prayer. We're told that he was honorable and that his prayer was answered. But when you come over to chapter 5, verse 1, we have a man's name with a negative message beside it. We have Reuben, the firstborn of Israel. But because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. Now that's a sad commentary, isn't it? He was the firstborn. He should have gotten the birthright, but the birthright instead was given to Joseph's two sons. 
you don't see a tribe of Joseph, but there's the land of Ephraim and Manasseh. Those were his sons. As a matter of fact, half of the tribe of Manasseh settled east of the Jordan, half west, and so they're called the half tribes. And here is why. Joseph got double inheritance because Reuben lost his. Sad message printed in this passage. So we want good stuff written beside our names in the book of life. Chapter 6, he gives another genealogy, this time not of the kings, but of the priests, the Levites, actually, the tribe of Levi. And if you look at chapter 6, verse 48, he tells us, that the kinsmen, their kinsmen, the Levites, were appointed for all the service of the tabernacle of the house of God. But Aaron and his sons offered on the altar burnt offering to make atonement for Israel. The Levites were the priests, but they weren't all priests. All priests were Levites, not all Levites were priests. Did you follow that? The first verse there tells us that the Levites were appointed to be servants in the tabernacle or in the temple. They had jobs to do. Some of them trimmed the wicks. Some of them carried the tabernacle equipment. Uh, they all had jobs to do. Some of them, the line of Aaron, were the priests. So all of Aaron's line were priests. The Levites were to serve in the temple and so God gives us their names their genealogy when you come over to chapter 9 we know that this uh, book of first chronicles was written after the exile because at the end of verse 1 it tells us that they were exiled to Babylon and it even tells us why it was because of their unfaithfulness but verse 2 tells us who the first people to return to the land were. And guess who it was? The priests, the Levites. Why? Because God is concerned about the temple. He's bringing them back to rebuild the temple. And so the first people he brings back are the Levites and the priests. You know, for boring genealogies, we've just gone through nine chapters and we've learned quite a bit, haven't we? We come now to the second section of this book. It's David's reign, but it has to do with the temple. And everything that we see him do is preparing for the building of the temple. Chapter 11, verse 4, for example. David and all his men go to Jerusalem. They fight the Jebusites, and they capture the city of Jerusalem. All right, they have the Jerusalem because that's where the temple is going to be built. Then we come over to chapters 13 through 15, and 46 times the books of Chronicles talk about the ark. And in chapter 15, verse 1, it tells us that David built houses for himself in the city of David, and he prepared a place for the ark of God. He even pitched a tent for it. And he said, No one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord chose them to carry the ark. David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark to the place he had prepared. Then verse 13, he says, Because you did not carry it at the first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us. It goes on to tell us how they carried the ark on their shoulders on poles this time. Now what he's talking about there is, Remember how the ark, and remember what the ark was, the ark was the dwelling place of God. It was the holy of holies in the tabernacle. And that ark had been taken by the Philistines. And finally, they had returned it because it was caused, having God's presence in their midst was causing them all kinds of problems. And they sent it back, but it only came halfway. And it stayed there for a hundred years.